Alterations in Children's Health There's many alterations in children's health, but we're not going to talk about all of them. We're going to focus on some of the more common communicable diseases and health issues or problems of childhood. With chronic illness and family adjustments, chronic illnesses of a child will affect the entire family to varying extents and needs must be assessed for each family member. Special needs is a broad category of illness or disease of a, child, of a child. These are frequently Down syndrome and fetal alcohol syndrome children. These children might not be diagnosed as special needs until a delay in development is noticed. There may be some cognitive issues that encompasses any type of mental difficulty or deficiency. It does replace the term mental retardation. Developmental issues can be any significant lag in the child's physical, cognitive, behavioral, emotional, or social development when compared with developmental norms. Delays are usually seen in gross and fine motor and speech development. Trends in care. Medical help enters the home and adapts the, to the child as opposed to the child in the hospital adapting to the health care setting. Developmental focus is on the child's developmental level rather than the chronological age of the child or diagnosis. Focus is placed on normalizing the experiences, adapting the environment, and promoting coping skills, and integrating the child into normal activities as soon as possible. Family-centered care is taking into consideration that the family is the one constant in the child's life. If it does not function well, then it will affect how the rest of the child's life functions. Family health care provider communication is often a difficult aspect because the health care provider might have to disclose serious acute or chronic illnesses of a child, but it is very vital to the care of the child and it must be forthcoming with information regarding the child's health. Shared decision making. The child, family, and health care providers all need to be on the same it be in on the decision making of the care regarding the child. Normalization allows the child to participate in as many normal social activities as possible, just as a person without a disability would. Modification may have to be made, but it's in the best interest of the child. You also need to support coping methods, serving as a role model for appropriate interactions with the child. Ensure that parents and siblings perceive the child as a child first with unique needs. Encourage communication among the family members. Include all family in process, in the care process and plan so consistency with the child is maintained. Explain all terms, medical and technical, and if you don't know something, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. Acknowledge competencies and the knowledge of the child. A disability does not always affect neurological function. There is an impact on the parents. Have this, they have the stress of grieving over the loss of a perfect child. The child may not achieve developmental milestones on time or may not achieve them at all. The child may not be placed in a regular classroom at school or they may have to attend a special school for children with special needs. And when the child reaches the maximum attainment of development, such as learning, they have to understand the child may never learn how to read or walk. The parents have issues with sexuality and or independence during the adolescent age. They have to make a plan for future placement if the child will not be able to live alone or if the parents can no longer care for them. And this can put a strain on marriage, finances, and resources. With the siblings, you have to let them know that they're valued, listen to them, praise their patience, sacrifice, and help helpfulness, acknowledge their personal strengths, and make sure that everyone spends special time with them. 
inform teachers that they have a disabled sibling living at home because that sibling may have some issues with jealousy or stress or exhibit behaviors at school that are not seen at home. To involve the siblings, you have to find ways to include them in the care and decisions, but you also need to limit their caregiving responsibilities. Help them develop competencies to teach the child new skills or provide them with opportunities to advocate for the ill child and allow the child, the sibling, to set their own pace of involvement. With sibling relationships, value every child, avoiding comparisons. You need to make sure that you're fair with discipline, attention, and resources. Legitimize reasonable anger. Respect reluctance to be with the ill child or to include the ill child in activities. There are some, spe some special health needs with special needs children. With the Down syndrome, a congenital heart defect is very normal. It's common. So that means they can have respiratory tract infections these are prevalent because of the hypotonicity of the chest and abdominal muscles. They also have a dysfunction of the immune system and the thyroid system. Those children that have the fragile X syndrome, this is the second most common cause of cognitive impairment following the Down syndrome. It's caused by an abnormal gene on the X chromosome, and we see violent temper outbursts, decreased attention span, and hyperactivity. There might also be some hearing impairment. Uh, these people can have speech impairment in addition to the hearing impairment, depending on the degree of the hearing impairment. It can cause developmental delays, increased risk for injury because of their inability to hear, Visual impairments can also cause developmental delays if it's not treated in a timely fashion. And autism is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder that really has an unknown etiology. The degree of disability is dependent upon the degree of autism and the behaviors that are exhibited. It exhibits with complex, bizarre behaviors. There may be some self-abusive behavior in severe cases. Uh, and mild cases may just require minimal supervision. But the majority have some degree of cognitive impairment, although some of these children may be savants. Autistic children generally do have social impairment. The hallmark sign of autism is a lack of eye contact along with speech and language delays. The incidence of infectious process has declined since the requirement of immunizations. There are serious complications that can occur from these infections, um, but they've been further reduced with the use of antibiotics and antitoxins. It's necessary to identify the infectious agent because this is of primary importance to prevent exposure to others. So let's look at each one individually briefly. Impetigo is a bacterial infection that begins as a red macule that later becomes vesicular. It ruptures easily and then the exudate will dry to form a heavy crust. We treat it with bactericidal ointment, oral or parenteral antibiotics. You can soften the lesions with a 1 to 20 burro solution compress. Good hand washing is necessary and keeping the child clean. With conjunctivitis, the usual cause is viral, but it can also be bacterial. There may be some purulent drainage with bacterial and watery drainage with the viral. The conjunctiva is inflamed, eyelids are swollen. We treat it with topical antibacterial agents, keeping the eye clean, warm, moist compresses, and good hand washing. Chicken pox is obtained through direct contact or droplet airborne spread and contaminated objects. The incubation period is two to three weeks and the child is infectious one day prior to the eruption to six days after the first crop of sores appear. They start off with a macule, 
that progresses to a papule, to a vesicle, and then they crust over as they burst. They are more prevalent on the trunk. There may be a low fever with malaise, anorexia, puritis, and irritability. We treat it symptomatically. Keep the child clean. A cyclovir or Zavirax may help decrease the number of lesions, and these children really need to avoid pregnant women. <coughs> Excuse me, rubiola and measles, it's the same thing, is contacted through direct contact with droplets. The virus can also be in secretions, blood, and urine. The incubation period is 10 to 20 days. The child is infectious four days before to five days after the appearance of the rash. Coplic spots, or small irregular red spots that have a minute bluish-white center, are first seen on the buccal mucosa two days before the rash appears. It is more prevalent, uh, the rash is more prevalent in the head and trunk. They may also have a brownish appearance. The child may have a fever, anorexia, abdominal pain, malaise, and lymphadenopathy. If the child has a vitamin A deficiency with measles, it will increase morbidity. We treat it symptomatically. I, antibiotics may be administered with high-risk children, a cool mist vaporizer, and keeping the child clean. With mumps, this is contracted through direct contact with saliva or droplets. The incubation period is 14 to 21 days. They're infectious immediately before and after swelling begins. You might see a fever, headache, malaise, anorexia, earache, the parotid glands begin to swell, and there may be pain and tenderness. Treat it symptomatically encourage fluids, and use hot and cold compresses. With rubella, or German measles, this is obtained through nasopharyngeal secretions. The virus is also present in blood, stool, and urine. The incubation period is 14 to 21 days. The child is infectious seven days before to five days after the rash. They may have a low-grade fever, headache, malaise, anorexia, mild conjunctivitis, a sore throat, lymphadenopathy. The rash is first on the face and then it moves downward and it will disappear in that same order. Again, you treat it symptomatically and these children need to avoid contact with pregnant women. Fifth disease is a respiratory secretions and blood contaminant. The incubation period is 4 to 21 days and it they don't know for sure how long the child is infectious. There's a three-stage rash. Stage one is erythema on the face and the cheeks that has gone in one to four days. Stage two is maculopapular red spots on the upper and lower extremities that can last a week. And stage three is where the rash subsides and reappears if the skin is irritated or traumatized. You may see some aplastic anemia with it and there may be an absent rash with aplastic anemia. Treat it symptomatically and use droplet precautions. In roseola, there is no reported contact with the infected person, but they think it's possibly infected saliva. The incubation period is 5 to 15 days, and again, they're not certain when they're infectious. They may have a high fever for three to four days with a drop in fever with the appearance of a rash. The rose pink rash is first on the trunk and it spreads outward. It lasts one to two days. Cervical and post-auricular lymphadenopathy. There may be an inflamed pharynx, cough. The treatment is symptomatic. <coughs> Excuse me, with scarlet fever, this is contracted through direct contact with an infected person or droplets and direct contact with contaminated articles. The incubation period is one to seven days and they're infectious from incubation up to months. You may see an abrupt high fever, tachycardia, vomiting, headache, chills, malaise, abdominal pain, halitosis, enlarged tonsils, pharynx is edematous and beefy red, 
The first one to two days the tongue is coated and papilla is red and swollen. And this is called a white strawberry tongue. Then the white sloughs off and prominent papilla, this is called the red strawberry tongue, is left. The palate is <coughs> has lesions on it. The rash appears within 12 hours, especially in the axilla and groin, and they may have flushed cheeks. You treat it with antibiotics, supportive treatment, encourage fluids, discard infectious utensils. Pertussis is spread through direct contact or droplet spread or indirect contact with freshly contaminated articles. The incubation period is 6 to 20 days. They are infectious greatest during the catarrhal state where they have the upper respiratory infection. The upper respiratory infection and low-grade fever will last one to two weeks and they'll have that dry hacking cough. Then they'll have the onset of the paroxysms with the cough being most common at night. They've got that short rapid cough with the sudden inspiration and the high-pitched crowing that sounds like a whooping sound. Their cheeks can be flushed or cyanotic, eyes will even bulge and tongue protrude. This can last four to six weeks. And if there's a lot of mucus, there may be some vomiting following coughing. Treat it with antimicrobial therapy, supportive therapy, hydration, oxygen, droplet precautions, cough medicine, unfortunately, is usually not very helpful. And here's some pictures of some of those diseases. Parasitic infections are the most frequent infection in the world. Intestinal infections are caused by parasites, and this has increased in the United States, especially in children in daycare. The two most common are giardiasis and pinworms. You treat the first one with antibiotics, appropriate sanitation, and avoid swimming in stagnant water. With pinworms, they are given an antiparasitic medication and the entire family should be treated and appropriate sanitation should also be utilized. With viral infections we look at the cold sore or herpe herpes simplex. It's transmitted through direct contact with an infected person with a communicability period of four to five days. Signs and symptoms include grouped sores, burning and itching, vesicles that have an inflammatory base. They're usually on or near those junctures of the lip or the nose. The vesicles will then dry and form a crust following exfoliation and spontaneous healing in 8 to 10 days. They may have some regional lymphadenopathy. Nursing interventions include educating on avoiding secondary infections, the use of sunscreen to assist in preventing lip blisters, and on preventing spread and adherence to the medication regimen. Herpes zoster or shingles is transmitted through direct contact with fluid from the rash blisters. The person who has never had chicken pox might develop chicken pox. The communicability period is while the rash is current. Signs and symptoms include vesicles, usually confined to following an affected nerve path, and it is preceded by neuralgic pain and or itching. Interventions include analgesics for pain and the use of local moist compresses, drying lotions, contact precautions, education on hand hygiene, and spread of infection. RSV, the respiratory synctival, uh, yeah, that virus, is the most co frequent cause of hospitalization for children under one year of age. It's a significant risk factor for the development of asthma up to the age of 13. It affects the epithelial cells of the respiratory tract and it can result in those cells shedding into the bronchioles and causing obstruction. Signs and symptoms initially include rhinorrhea, pharyngitis, coughing, sneezing, wheezing, possible ear or eye drainage, and intermittent fever. 
As the illness progresses, you might see some cyanosis, increased coughing and wheezing, tachypnea, and retractions. And with severe illnesses, there may be some tachypnea over 70 breaths per minute, poor air exchange, listlessness, apneic spells, and poor breath sounds. There may be some hospitalization if there's respiratory distress. We place these children on contact and standard precautions, treating symptomatically with cool humidified oxygen, adequate fluid intake, airway maintenance and medications, or IV fluids. At home, we encourage good hand washing, disposal of tissues, avoiding touching the eyes and the nose if possible, saline drops and suction with a bulb syringe before feedings, and then with nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Maintain good hand washing practices. Use antimicrobial cleaners and brush the teeth or rinse the mouth following emesis to help minimize enamel damage from gastric acid. Fungal infections include ringworm or tinea capitis, which is ringworm of the head. It's transmitted from person to person or animal to person by direct or indirect contact with infected areas. The communicability period is 10 to 14 days with symptoms of lesions in the scalp that can extend into the hairline or the neck. Characteristic configuration has a scaly circumscri circumscribed patch or patchy scaly areas of alopecia. It can be asymptomatic. It may have a severe deep inflammatory reaction and there might be some puritis. Nursing interventions include education on adhering to the medication regimen, hand hygiene, and preventive education. Tinea corpus is ringworm of the body. It's usually transmitted animal to person with a communicability period of four to 10 days. Signs and symptoms include the round oval arimethitis scaling patch that spreads peripherally and clear centrally and it's usually unilateral. Nursing interventions include education on adhering to the medication regimen, local antifungal cream one inch beyond the lesion, and use the cream one to two weeks after the lesions are gone. Antinia pedis, or athlete's feet, is transmitted by wearing plastic shoes. In other words, they're not allowed to breathe. Communicate Ability period is variable, but it's thought to be two to three weeks. Signs and symptoms include lesions on the plantar surface of the feet or in between toes. There might be maceration or fissuring between the toes, patches of pinhead sized vesicles on the plantar surface, and puritis. Nursing interventions include adherence to medication regimen, local application of antifungal powder, compresses or soaks followed by application of glucocorticoid cream, avoiding heat and perspiration by wearing clean light socks and well ventilated shoes, and avoiding occlusive shoes. It can be caused by a group of closely related filamentous fungi that invade primarily the hair, skin, and nails. This type of infection is caused by intracellular parasites obtained through bites of infected lice, fleas, ticks, and mites. Lyme disease is the most common tick-borne disorder. Stage 1 includes inoculation of 3 to 31 days following the bite. Stage 2 is the most serious stage and it involves neurological, cardiac, and musculoskeletal systems. Stage 3 involves musculoskeletal pain and late neurologic problems including deafness and chronic encephalopathy. We treat it with antibiotics, monitoring for lesions or viral infections. Early treatment though prevents development of the latter stages of disease. We always encourage searching the body for ticks after being in a highly wooded or large grassy area. Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever has a gradual onset with fever, malaise, anorexia, and myalgia, or an abrupt onset that has a rapid temperature elevation, chills, vomiting, myalgia, severe headache. 
the rash is primarily on the extremities and you treat it with antibiotics and supportive therapy. Poisoning. In all intentional or unintentional poisonings, immediately contact Poison Control Center prior to rushing to the hospital. With corrosive poisoning, this is with strong acid or alkaloids, alkalis that can be found in drain, toilet, or oven cleaners, electric dishwasher detergent, mildew remover, batteries, clintitest tablets, denture cleaners, bleach, might have severe burning pain in the mouth, throat, and stomach, etc. We treat it by contradicting, contraindicating vomiting. It's not encouraged. Maintain a patent airway, administer analgesics, don't allow any oral intake. Esophageal stricture may require repeated dilatations or surgery. Hydrocarbon poisoning is from gas or kerosene, lamp oil, mineral seed oil, lighter fluid, turpentine, paint thinner, thinner and paint remover. Emergency tra treatment, again, inducing emesis is contraindicated, gastric decontamination and emptying are questionable, and there may be some system treatment with chemical pneumonia, or system treatment of chemical pneumonia. Acetaminophen poisoning is from acetaminophen, Tylenol. There's four different stages and it can be very severe and go from two to four hours and up to seven days. Some of the situations may be permanent. If the patient does not die in hepatic stage, they usually will recover. The emergency treatment is mucomist and it's usually given orally after being diluted in fruit juice or soda and they receive a loading dose and then 17 maintenance doses. Salicylate poisoning or aspirin poisoning. Emergency treatment includes hospitalization for severe toxicity, emesis, lavage, activated charcoal or a cathartic, Sodium bicarb transfusion may help correct metabolic acidosis and urinary alkalinization. They may require anticonvulsants or vitamin K if there's bleeding. And in severe cases, they may require hemodialysis. With iron poisoning, the sources would be mineral supplements or vitamins. Emergency treatment includes emesis or lavage, chelation therapy if there's severe intoxication that may turn the urine orange. Plant poisoning. Uh, consider most plants to be poisonous and then you're safe knowing which ones are not. Emergency treatment includes inducing emesis, washing the skin or the eyes, and supportive care is necessary. Lead poisoning can be found in paints, a lot of old toys or old paints, old furniture. Pool cue chalk or artist paints or jewelry, etc. We need to educate about potential adverse health effects and what, what it can do to the child. We need to educate on how to reduce exposure Good nutrition uh, can help reduce absorption and effects of lead. There is a need for follow-up monitoring and results of environmental investigation. Respiratory infections are classified by the location or of the involvement. Upper respiratory infections include in the, na in the nose or the pharynx. Nasopharyngitis is a common cold and it's self-limiting, it's viral, it usually lasts 7 to 10 days. We manage it by elevating the head of the bed to assist with drainage, using a vaporizer, saline drops, suction as necessary, and encouraging fluids. With pharyngitis, this is from a group A beta hemolytic streptococci or strep throat is 80 to 90 percent of those are all viral based. 
treatment will include antibiotics, maybe, uh, and supportive care using Tylenol, ibuprofen, etc. With tonsillitis, sometimes this includes the adenoids. <coughs> Excuse me. And we provide comfort, soft or liquid diets to encourage swallowing, a cool mist vaporizer, warm saltwater gargles. And if you've never used those, they're very, very helpful in treating a sore throat. Throat lozenges, analgesics, and if necessary, prepare them for surgery. With lower respiratory infections, this includes the bronchi and bronchioles and the trachea. The croup uh, syndromes involve the epiglottis. Epiglottitis can be a true medical emergency due to the swollen epiglottis causing an airway obstruction. Uh, croup is commonly caused by a virus such as RSV, group A strep, staphylococcus, the influenza H, chlamydia, mycoplasma, and pneumococci. Conditions that can weaken the respiratory tract defense and predispose a child to infection would be allergies, asthma, cardiac anomalies that have pulmonary congestive factors, and cystic fibrosis. And also there are seasonal variations. Epidemics are usually in the winter and spring with the RSV. And infection-related asthma is more frequent in cold weather. Cystic fibrosis <coughs> is a multi-system clinical feature where the pancreas and the bronchioles might be obstructed. There's increased viscosity of mucous gland secretion, so it, it obstructs small passages. There may be an elevation of sweat electrolytes. And basically, it's a progressive lung disease, and these children are infection-prone. The four goals for treating cystic fibrosis are to prevent or minimize pulmonary complications, making sure that they receive adequate nutrition for growth, making sure they're appropriately active physically, and promote a reasonable quality of life for the child and family. We treat them with, um, by helping prevent pulmonary infections, chest physiotherapy, might be used, bronchodilators, a flood or mucus clearance device, a therapy vest device, pulmona uh, pul pulmozyme, cough suppressants are not encouraged because we want them to cough up that mucus, and using an exercise regimen with breathing patterns to help mo mobilize the secretions. Teaching the client um, about the disease is very important. Providing education about diets, keeping their immunizations up to date, including the pneumococcal and flu. And as the child reaches that stage, maybe discussing an end-of-life care plan with the family. Otitis media is a common complication of acute respiratory infections. It is an infection of the middle ear and it's a result of a blocked eustachian tube that prevents normal drainage. Infants and children are at increased risks because their eustachian tubes are shorter, wider, and straighter. We treat it by encouraging fluids, using local heat for pain, lying on the affected ear, Medications might include analgesics or antipyretics, and sometimes antibiotics. Ear tubes might be required if they have repetitive ear infections. Miscellaneous disorders would be a cardiovascular dysfunction, such as acquired and congenital heart defects that include primarily anatomic abnormalities that might be present at birth. 
There might be septal defects of the arterial and ventricular areas, patent ductus arteriosus, which is a failure of the fetal ductus to arteriosus to close, stenosis, which is aortic, valvular, or pulmonic. Tertology of Fallot includes four defects. There might be pulmon pulmonic stenosis, an overriding aorta, right ventricular hypertrophy, and a ventricular septal defect, a decreased pulmonary flow, and mixed defects uh, wind up that category. Gastrointestinal dysfunctions include a cleft lip and palate, which are facial malformations where the maxillary, median, nasal processes, or palate midline don't close. They can be surgically repaired, but they can interfere with feeding until they are repaired. <coughs> Excuse me. A hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is an obstructive disorder where pyloric sphincter muscle becomes thickened. A celiac disease is intestinal intolerance to gluten and causes malabsorption. Hernias are a protrusion of an organ. Actually, it might be a portion of an organ, or it can be an entire organ that's pushed through a weakening in the abdominal wall. Danger results when circulation is compromised. A genitourinary dysfunction could be hypospadiasis. Spadias is the opening of the urethra on the ventral surface of a penis or minimal change nephrotic syndrome. These episodes often happen with bacterial or viral infections and could cause weight gain and edema, decreased output, hypoalbuminemia, ascites. You treat it with dietary restrictions, fluid restrictions, corticosteroids, and maybe even some immunosuppressive therapy. Neurological dysfunctions include ADHD, cerebral palsy, which is a permanent disorder of the development of movement and posture causing activity limitation. It's attributed to disturbances in developing fetal or infant brain. It involves sensation, perception, communication, cognition, behavior, and abnormal muscle tone and coordination. With spastic CP, it, there may be some hypertonicity and poor control of posture, balance, and coordinated motion. Dyskinetic CP can be irregular jerking muscle uh, movements, a slow worm-like writhing movement, drooling, and imperfect speak articulation. And ataxic cerebral palsy can be a wide-based gait with rapid repetitive movements. A myelomeningocele is a visible defect that has an external sac-like protrusion that contains meninges, spinal fluid, and nerves. Hydrocephalus is common with a myelomeningocele. We see spina bifida cystica. They may have a limited use of their legs, genitourinary and bowel dysfunction. With endocrinolo endocrinological dysfunction, there may be a pituitary dysfunction with diabetes insipidus or growth deficiency, a thyroid dysfunction, adrenal dysfunction, or diabetes mellitus. And with nutritional dysfunction, we may see rickets, which is caused by vitamin D and calcium deficiencies. In first aid, you always treat the ABCs, the airway, breathing, and circulation, because children can go south very, very quickly. Changes in blood pressure or level of consciousness in a child are usually late signs of complications. Always remain calm. Emergencies do not always allow for building of trust. Use one person as the primary nurse, if possible, to communicate with the child. Fever, make sure you monitor the hydration status, administer antipyretics, and never give aspirin to a child for treatment of fever. With lacerations, wash the laceration gently with soap and water for several minutes. Control bleeding and suture as necessary. Head injuries account for the highest mortality rate in children. 
The seriousness is related to the force of impact. The injury is caused by brain swelling and bleeding, which places pressure on the brain, increasing intracranial pressure. Bone and joint injuries, always ice them, elevate them, and provide pain medications. With fractures, teach cast care and crutch care.